Hey, welcome to Southside Online. My name is Chris and we're thrilled to have you join us today. I have the privilege of working with all of our five Southside locations, our staff, many of you as volunteers. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for those that are generous to allow us to create experiences for children, for teenagers, for adults across the South Side of Atlanta who maybe are far from God and need the hope that can be found in a relationship with Him. And if that's you today, we want you to know we're so glad that you've joined us. Hope you'll enjoy our service and if, you're, if this is your first time with us, you can go to our website, southside.org, to learn more about our church and get some quest questions answered that you might have. Well, today we're in part three of this series that we started uh, just a couple of weeks ago called Intimate Encounters. And our friend Joel Thomas has been sharing with us about relationships and marriage and, and how God feels about that. And so I hope that it's been inspiring to you so far. Uh, but today is part three of this series. And so before we jump in with Joel, we're going to sing some songs together. Kristen and John are going to be leading us, so let's sing together. I'm 
turn graves into garden. You turn bones into army. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one in cancer. You turn graves into garden. You turn bones into army. Turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. He's the only one who cares. Lord, he's the only one who cares. That's so 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 good news this morning i'm so glad that god is in my army and on my side and i just like everyone else want to build my life upon the love and the strength and compassion that god has for us sing this worship with us worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who ever say you worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
Well, today we're concluding our series on relationships called Intimate Encounters. And uh, if you haven't been with us, I'll catch us up in just a minute. But we've been talking about the nature of true intimacy and the fact that in our hypersexualized world that uh, what we all crave uh, is not what's portrayed, actually, in the movies and uh, in the magazines and in uh, social media. Uh, these pictures and these images, these things we see, they're not exactly what we're after. And uh, last week, we talked specifically about how uh, our, de- our design, the design Design of humanity and specifically of the first relationship. We get this picture and what we were really designed for was oneness, uh, a, 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 an intimacy that, that involved attachment and, it, and it's forged by access as we gain greater access to one another physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And, and as a matter of fact, last week we looked at the pinnacle. I told you uh, I was gonna give you a definition for true intimacy. If you weren't here last week, uh, we looked and I, I didn't even have to make up the definition because it's right in the scriptures. The pinnacle, at the pinnacle of the description of the first relationship uh, between Adam and his wife Eve, uh, we're told that they were naked and unashamed, it, which, which is really, it, it's, it's the idea that there was nothing between them no fear, nothing to hide. And, and they were fully accessible and fully offering uh, uh, themselves to one another. And so we've been talking in this series about some, some significant components that forge true intimacy in relationships. Week one, we talked about the idea of exclusivity. Uh, you know this. This is, this is something we all know. If everybody's invited, it's not an intimate gathering. Uh, it's why only two of you go on your date night and every once in a while you, you, you date with other couples, but it's not as intimate. It's why only two people go on the honeymoon. It's because... Uh, uh, intimacy requires exclusivity. And last week, we talked about the fact that it also requires vulnerability, which is often difficult for us. And unknowingly, uh, sometimes unknowingly, we sabotage our relationships by putting up walls. Uh, we don't realize that we're doing it. And, and, and in some cases, um, we don't know how to pull those walls down, but uh, you can't have an intimate relationship if someone's not being willing to be vulnerable. Today, uh, I want to talk about another essential component uh, to intimacy. And I'll just say this. This isn't all there is. Uh, This is just three parts of this. But another essential component that fits with these other two uh, that I want to unpack a little bit today is the idea of generosity. Um, Love, when you think about love, love is incredibly generous. I I don't know uh, what comes to mind for you uh, when I say the word generous. Most of the time when we think of generosity, we think of, of money. We think of, you know, people being generous with their stuff and with their money. But I want you to think about relationships for a second. Generosity is a critical component, as we're going to see in a minute. But one of the things that makes generosity difficult in a relationship, when you're in a relationship with other, with other people, is because uh, relationships uh, are dangerous. And the reason I know that is because half the time I, I come, to, I talk with people and they're in the middle of challenges in their relationship. Uh, one of the things they say is I've been hurt in the past or this was something that hurt me. It was difficult. Those relationships can, can often uh, contr- uh, contribute to the trauma we experience in life. Uh, relationships are not only dangerous, they can be confusing. When we, we, uh, we talked about this last week, when, when somebody's actions don't, match up with their words, what they say their commitment is and, and, and the way they behave in relationship to us, it can be confusing in relationships. It's difficult to sort out the challenges sometimes. Um, relationships can be uncertain. Some of you have been in relationships. Maybe you are now, I don't make light of this, there, where the future is uncertain. I, I, I've been there, my wife and I have been there where we weren't sure where we were gonna end up or what was gonna happen in our relationship. And overall, uh, relationships just have difficulty. And they have significant challenges that sometimes that we, we can't really navigate. We have a hard time getting through these on our own. Uh, last week, I told you about a time uh, when my wife, Jen, and I went through probably our biggest challenge. We've had a lot of challenges along the way, but our biggest challenge is about the seven or eight year mark uh, in our marriage. And um, uh, I, I, we, we got together with a counselor. Uh, we went, first went to, we thought we needed couples counseling. So we went to a counselor, somebody recommended to us and the counselor's like, okay, actually you have stuff you need to unpack and you have stuff you need to unpack. And so she sent us our separate ways and we uh, both saw a, a different counselor for a while to, to begin to unpack some of the stuff that was, was in our past. And as we were doing that, one of the things uh, my counselor suggested to me was a book called How We Love. It's a, a book by Mylon and Kay Yurkovich. And um, in this book, um, there's, there's, uh, it's just different than a lot of other books. But I, I gotta be honest, just, just in a moment of transparency, when she first told me she had a book, I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, do you not know what I do? I'm a pastor. 
I read books all the time. I've read every relationship book there is, and it's like they're all behavior modification, which isn't bad because some of us need to modify our behavior, amen? But the reality is um, this, this was different. She's like, no, no, you need to, to, to read this book. And so I, truthfully, I didn't buy the book. I didn't even buy the audible version of the book. I decided to go on and listen to a seminar that the authors had done that was sort of a recap of the book. So, you know, because this was sort of my homework for the next session, which I don't recommend you do this with your counselor, by the way. You will get found out. But so I, 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 um, I listened to this, I, this summary and, and I was like, I started listening. I was like, oh my goodness. Like the first session of this, of this, this seminar was actually the first two chapters of the book. And so then I quickly got the book, the Audible version, and I started listening to it. And I was like, this was different than anything I had experienced before. And as a matter of fact, as I was listening, I was like, this is the exact challenge, the thing, Jen and I, the puzzle we've been trying to figure out, the puzzle that we can't put together, the thing that has us puzzled in our relationship, this is the exact thing. And, 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 and the, the amazing thing was they so clearly articulated it. And, and I, I was like, we're not the first ones. We're not the only ones. As a matter of fact, this is so predictable. Somebody's actually written about it and published it in a book. So like what we're dealing with is not that unique. And the truth was, is in short, what we were dealing with in our relationship, one of the things was that our love, the way we loved each other wasn't really loving because we weren't free enough to love each other. Our love was transactional. It wasn't truly generous. It wasn't, I'm gonna give of my love freely to you regardless of what I get in return. It was transactional, I'll do for you if you'll do for me. And I know none of you deal with that, but we're gonna talk about it a little bit for a few minutes. Um, and if we're gonna talk about love, we have to go to the chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open it. If you have a digital Bible, this is my digital Bible. I'm gonna put the words on the screen here in a minute if you don't have a Bible with you. But 1 Corinthians 13, and I know some of you are thinking, I mean, are you kidding me? We're gonna, so it's the one that's in all the Christian uh, greeting cards for Valentine's Day, that's the verse, or the one that gets read at weddings all the time. That's how we know it. That's our context. But real quick, let me give you some context for the people who were first hearing this. The Apostle Paul is writing to Greek people, people in the Greek world. And, and what's interesting about the people in the Greek world is as it relates to, to religion, you gotta remember, they're converting from um, a, a religion of trying to please Greek gods, all, all the gods, to following a man named Jesus who pointed them towards one, the one true God. And, and as the Apostle Paul, there's a, there's a lot of difficulty in making this shift, not the least of which is their worship of the Greek gods was vertical only. The Greek gods could care less about their relationships with other people. It was, it, it, for them, it was, if we can keep the Greek gods happy, we make sacrifices to the Greek gods. We try to keep the Greek gods happy. We try to, to stay in right relationship with them so things will go well for us. And so there was a God for everything. If we could keep those gods happy, then things would go well for us in the world around us. But if the gods don't care about our relationships with other people, then why should we care? These are the people that have started following Jesus, a savior who said, no, 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 I'm rescuing you to something new. I, I wanna save you from that path into something new. And, and in this relationship, it not only matters, your relationships don't only matter vertically, they matter, matter horizontally. How you treat each other matters. First Corinthians 13, it begins this way. It says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Just quick recap is you may have the ability to speak. You may sound like the smartest and the most religious person in the room and have all the right theological answers, all the right Bible answers, know the scriptures in and out. You can have big faith. You can even sacrifice greatly for God. But if you don't have love, if that's not flowing out of a heart of love, if you don't have love towards others and towards God, it's of no value. None of that other stuff, none of the, the knowledge or the gifting or the faith or the sacrifice, it's not worth anything. If you don't have love, basically he's saying this is you are nothing. And if you don't have love, you gain nothing. Now that feels harsh. And it sort of seems like it's kind of a high bar, but you're not personally offended by that. And I'm not personally offended because 
we have love, right? Like we know we're, deep down, we think, we all think, oh, we're loving people. So I thought we would take a little test this morning. Because as a matter of fact, as Paul goes on, he gives us a bit of a litmus test to know if we have love or not. But here's what I'm gonna make you do. I'm gonna make you participate today. So here's what I'd love for you. I'd love for you all to stand up with me. I know, I know it's like, you're like, the other guy lets us sit during the whole service and we don't have to stand up. I get it, but I want you to stand up. Even if you're home, you can participate in this. If you're driving, just, just, just listen along. Don't, don't, don't try to participate. Here's how this is gonna work. Um, as, as you're standing up, I'm gonna go through the list one at a time. And if I get to one on the list that doesn't characterize you, you sit down. Got it? Everybody ready? It's gonna be fun. It's gonna, it's gonna be a blast. You ready? ready for this? All right. Love is patient. I'll wait. They're slowly going down. It's like we just lost a third of the room. Love is patient. All right, let's keep going. Love is kind. How many? Kind all the time? All right, we got some kind people in here. Kind all the time? All right. It does not envy. This is where I would sit down at this point, by the way. Um, you don't have to sit down if that's not you. So these are all the patient, kind, non-envying people. You should take note. These are some great people in the room. It does not boast ever. It, it is not proud. It's not proud. Okay, so this is good. How, how many people still standing? Okay, we got a good group here. The patient, kind non-envying, non-boastful, non-proud people. Okay, let, let's keep going. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't self-seek. It's not easily angered. <laughs> Remarkable. How about this one? It keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> Looks like we have one couple left and they look like they've been married for like 70 years, so... At this point, I'm gonna exit the stage and let them come up and finish the rest of the sermon. <laughs> Here's the thing, when you put it that way, it's like, okay, Paul, when you put it that way, I mean, I, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, you put it that way, does anybody have love? Can anybody really love? Here's the thing, all of those things at the root, at the core, they have something in common, it's generosity. And it's, it's like there's this generous spirit that says, I'm gonna be patient, I'm gonna be kind. I'm not gonna be boastful. I'm gonna be others focused. I'm not keeping records of wrong of other people. I'm gonna be generous towards people in every possible way. If that wasn't enough. He went on, he said, look, and on top of that, love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. But you're like, well, what does that have to do with relationships? Here's basically what he's saying. He's saying it doesn't delight in uncovering other people's mistakes. It's not like it delights or they're happy to find somebody else behaving badly. That, that, that doesn't, there's no joy in that. There's no joy in the gotcha moment when somebody behaves badly. It, it, it doesn't delight in evil, it rejoices with the truth. Well, another way of saying that is it, it, it embraces reality. Truth is just the reality of the way things really are. And so love, it, it, it doesn't, delight in catching other people behaving badly, but it's not gonna ignore the problems either. It doesn't close its eyes to things that are not going well or things that are, that are, that are causing dissonance or, or challenges and relationships. Love is committed to living in and dealing with reality. And then he gives us four absolutes, and this is what we're gonna camp on today. These are sort of the four action items of how do you live out this generous love? Here's what it does. If you wanna know how do you live out this generous love, love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Basically, love says, look, you're worth it. Because you're worth it, I will protect, I will trust, I will always hope, and I will always persevere in our relationship because I believe that you are worth it. You have worth to me. You have tremendous worth to me. So in the midst of, of, of our, our relationship, when, when things, I feel insecure and things seem, seem dangerous in our relationship, I'm gonna choose to protect you I'm gonna focus on you and not on me. And when, when things are confusing and I don't, I don't know why you're doing what you're doing or why you're acting the way you're acting, I'm gonna to choose to trust you. 
And when things are uncertain and I'm not sure of what's happening in the future of our relationship, you're worth waiting for. So I'm going to hope beyond hope in our relationship that something will happen, that God will intervene, that something will change in our future. And because you're worth fighting for, I'm gonna continue to persevere. I'm gonna continue to fight for our relationship. Because when, when you think about it, the truth is, is all of these dynamics are at play in a relationship. And, and what happens in, in a relationship is when we choose generosity, this, this extraordinary attribute in relationships, what happens is, is in the midst of all those things, in the context of a generous outlook in a relationship, the relationship, the, the people in the relationship, if they're truly loving in the midst of the biggest challenges, they go, I'm gonna choose to protect, not myself, but the person I'm in a relationship with. I'm gonna choose to trust them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose regardless to hope in, in, in our future together. And I'm gonna persevere. Now, here's the thing. I, I know you're arguing with me and that's okay. But, but here's the thing. Some of you are going, wait, 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 wait. But always, I mean, come on, Paul. Always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, always. I mean, isn't that irresponsible a little bit? I mean, it's, it's naive and, and irresponsible. But, but isn't that the nature of generosity? I mean, people can presume on your generosity. People can take advantage of your generosity. That, that's the nature or the risk of being generous in relationships. It's basically saying, even when you don't act worthy, I'm gonna choose to believe that you are worth it. And I'm gonna continue to move in your direction. I'm gonna continue to be generous in my love towards you. There's, there's this interesting um, article I read not long ago in, in the, uh, the Journal for Personal and, and Social Psychology, and it's on the be benefits of positive illusions in relationships. So it's basically, it, it's this whole study that was done on, on uh, and as a matter of fact, it's the most comprehensive study done on romantic re relationship satisfaction. It was done by a doctor named uh, Dr. Sandra Murray uh, out of the University of Buffalo. You can look this up on your own. There was a team of, uh, I think, seven clinicians or so that did this study. It was, a, it was, again, the most extensive study done on romantic relationships. And, 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 and the crazy thing is, is as they studied this, here, here's, here's sort of the summary of what they discovered. They discovered that couples with the highest levels of satisfaction, so most comprehensive study, couples with the highest levels of satisfaction in their relationship rated each other more positively in every quality than their partners actually rated themselves. So the partner, the, 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 the one spouse had a higher view of their partner or their spouse than they had of themselves in every category. The, the conclusion of the, the study was that when your spouse or your significant other um, knows that you have an extremely generous, even unrealistic view of them and of their character and of who they are, that you're drawn towards them or they're drawn towards you. When you have, when you have this unrealistically positive picture of them, it's like, it's like it's magnetic towards them. And when you think about this, this is true of you when you think back to your childhood. I mean, who were the people that you were drawn to? You were drawn to friends that had a, a positive view of you, coaches, teachers, maybe a parent, uh, uh, maybe an uncle, but, but they had this unbelievably positive view of you. In fact, they would use words, they would associate words with you that you wouldn't even associate with yourself. The same thing happens in marriage is when you portray and communicate this idealistic, this distorted, this sort of illusionary view of how extraordinary you believe your spouse is worthy of your love. They're drawn towards you. Not only that, this is the most fascinating thing. They weren't even looking for this. The study showed that those that were on the receiving end of this, this gener generous positive illusion, um, that they were motivated actually to live up to their partner's view of them. It actually changed the, their partner's belief of them, actually changed their behavior, their stated belief and the way their, their behavior portrayed that belief. It actually changed the behavior of their spouse. Now, here's why this is so challenging. It's because one of the most difficult things to do, one of the most difficult seasons or, or situations to have a generous outlook towards your spouse is when there's gaps in your relationship, right? 
Like there's a gap. And specifically this happens when um, what we expect doesn't equal what we experience. You, we've all experienced this. You expected your spouse to behave in a certain way, but they were late again. They didn't call. They weren't forthcoming. Um, the, 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 the story didn't add up. And what, when what they said they'd do and what they should have done, what everybody knows a husband should do or what everybody knows a wife should do or what everybody knows a, a best friend or a significant other or a fiance, what they should do when it's not what they do. The truth is, is we're tempted to be suspicious versus believing the best. We're, we're tempted to, to be suspicious of them and it creates this gap in our relationships. And, and it's a lot like trying to solve a puzzle. And there's two pieces to every puzzle. And, and, and some of you know this. You've, you've experienced this before in a relationship. Anybody like puzzles, by the way? Puzzle fans? All right, great. There's like six of you. It's awesome. <laughs> we like puzzles in our family. In fact, uh, usually around holidays when we're going to be home for a long period of time, we'll do some, we'll do some puzzles in our, in our, in our house. And, 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 and this, is, this is not unlike a puzzle. And, and when it comes to the puzzle, there's two pieces. And the first one is what I see. This is what creates my, the, the dissonance and the gap. When, when what I see is different um, than what I expected, um, which, which, which is really about their stuff, the person you're in relationship with. It, it's, about, it's about their stuff. And everybody has stuff, you know that, right? You, everybody has the stuff they bring in a relationship. If you don't know if you have stuff or not, just ask your spouse or ask the person you're dating. You have stuff, and I'm not talking about the physical stuff that's in storage and all that stuff. It is baggage, but it's a different kind of baggage, and you have it. We all have it. And, and what happens is, is when, when what I see in our relationship, when, when your stuff shows up in the relationship, I'm tempted to be suspicious in the relationship as, it show, as opposed to believing the best. I have a hard time protecting and trusting and hoping and persevering. This becomes incredibly difficult for me to operate within this circle when you're bringing the danger that I'm experiencing or the insecurity, when you're the one that's creating confusion in our relationship, when you're the one that's created uncertainty, when you're the one that's being difficult. I, when I see this, when, when it's your stuff, I have a hard time believing the best because believing the best is, and again, according to this study, it's coming up with the most generous explanation for your behavior, for your spouse's behavior and choosing to believe it versus formulating other destructive beliefs or thoughts, which we all do this. And again, some of you are going, I mean, come on, isn't this naive? Like even if, or even when they're acting in the worst possible way, I mean, you should, I should ignore what I see. Remember the apostle Paul, this is why he, this is why this literature is so brilliant. Like he started by saying, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it doesn't enjoy catching somebody. It doesn't enjoy pointing out somebody's fault, but it chooses to live in reality and live within the truth. And what happens is sometimes the way somebody's behaving, it creates challenges, it creates dissonance, it creates gaps in our relationships. And those gaps, we can't just ignore them. We have to live in reality of them. So, so here's what's gonna happen. When there's a gap, when there's something in our relationship that it's really because of what I see and because of your stuff, here's what I'm gonna do. When, when I can't believe the best, I'm gonna come directly to you. I'm not gonna talk about it with my mom or my friends or uh, some other people around or the kids. They're like that, these things happen all the time. I'm gonna come directly to you and I'm not gonna let my mind wander and, and create a case against you. And, and which, which again, we all do this, right? Like we, we, we're tempted to let our mind wander to wonder why they could be doing that. And, and oftentimes we go to the worst possible scenarios and, and we're tempted to formulate these destructive beliefs and these destructive ideals because of what we see. But instead, I'm gonna choose to believe that there's a good explanation and I'm gonna come directly to you and I'm gonna do it fast because I don't want there, because if there's a gap in our relationship, that is the opposite of intimacy. There's space and, and that means we're not one. That means our relationship isn't connected. That means we don't have full access to one another and it lacks intimacy because of this gap and because of what I see. 
Now, this doesn't happen often when you have people in a relationship that are trustworthy. I mean, there is one thing that you have to trust somebody, but it's also, you need to be trustworthy as well. And here's what happens is trustworthy people, when, when I create a gap, when my behavior creates a gap in our relationship, I'm gonna come to you before you have to come to me. Isn't that what trustworthy people do? Hey, I did this and I know it made, 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 made you wonder about this. Or when I did this, I know last time I said I wasn't gonna do that and, and, and I did this and I need to come apologize to you. What that actually does is you, even though you behave badly, even though you broke your promise, you build trust by owning it yourself. Because when you get caught, it's like you didn't own up to anything. You get no credit for that. Like that's not humility coming to somebody else. That's just a humbling circumstance. And you get humbled by being found out. And love doesn't delight in that, but it wants to deal with reality. And, and when there are gaps, when there are gaps, reflects your relationship, what we do is we go to what we saw. We go to what we experienced. We go to what happened and we wanna point a finger. But as I told you, there's two puzzle pieces. There's another piece to this puzzle. And, and I'm betting some of you can guess what it is. Let's see if I can get this puzzle piece here. Um, the truth is, is there's not only what I see, but there's who I am. There's who I am. And there's my life experiences. What I see is your stuff. This is my stuff. Now, this is the harder part. This is going, hey, maybe, I mean, maybe, I, mean, I know it's not a big chance, but maybe, just maybe, there, there might be a possibility that some of this has to do with me. I mean, that, I mean it was their, their actions, it's what they did, it's what I experienced, but there might be something a part of this that's about who I am. It might be something about my past or my past hurts or my insecurities or an, another experience I had somewhere else that's causing me to have gross pains in this situation going, I, I've seen this before, I've experienced this before, I have a girlfriend or I have a, a guy friend who went through this before and this is what I think this is. And instead of coming directly to them, that's one of the things that causes us to formulate these ideas in our mind. Do you know, this is so common. Do you know that 90% of relationships and because of what was brought into the relationship rather than what happened in the relationship. 90% of relationships stem from something that was brought into the relationship rather than what happened in the relationship. Now, there's lots of things that can happen in a relationship to make it worse, be, to be sure. We all know that. You can complicate things for sure. But most of the time, what happened in the relationship is a result of what you brought into the relationship. It's a result of something that was already there before you entered into this relationship with, with somebody. And some of our expectations are a result of, of positive and healthy uh, things in our past and experiences. But others, so others, our actions and our behaviors come out of hurt and out of brokenness, out of false expectations, out of a reaction to something that we experienced in a previous relationship or in our family of origin. And when we choose to let our mind wander, what happens is, is it, we don't really realize this, but it wanders back into our past and we grab stuff from our past and we drag it into the future. We drag it into the present. And what it does is it leads to temptation toward viewing or thinking of things that are really unreality. They're not reality. They're not the reality of the situation. Sometimes they're absurdity. At the very least, they're obscurity. Because, our, because of our stuff, because of my stuff. It's not because of what I saw. It's because of what I dragged in because of what I've experienced before. It, it may have had nothing to do with this person. Oftentimes it doesn't. And that stuff creates insecurity for us in our relationships. Years ago, um, I shared a little bit last week, but in, in the most difficult season of our marriage, we've definitely hit some bumps along the way and we're still a work in progress, but about seven or eight years uh, into our marriage, so about 11, 11 12 years ago, um, we, we hit a really big bump and, and talk about uncertainty. I mean, I, honestly, uh, I, I remember it was, I remember going to Andy and saying, hey, I don't know if we're gonna make it. Like, this is really, really challenging and and, um, and, and so Jen and I went and saw uh, a counselor and, and we, after Sharon, we were on the phone with this counselor for a few hours, actually we didn't even go see her. We, we were on the phone with her. She said, hey, look, I don't think you guys need couples counseling. Jen, I think you need to see somebody. And Joel, I think you need to see somebody because I don't think your challenges are actually between you. I don't think it's about what's happening in your relationship. 
I think it's about what happened before that you brought into the relationship. And so Jen went to meet with her counselor. I went to meet with my counselor and I went to my counselor and Jen went to talk about her stuff with her counselor and I went to my counselor to talk about Jen's stuff because that's what, <laughs> that's what guys do. And not only that, it, it was like, it was her issue, like is what I thought. And so after several months, I remember my counselor saying to me at one point, she's like, hey, listen, by the way, if we're gonna keep talking about her stuff, um, I'm gonna fire you as my client, which I'm like, isn't this how you make, your, make a living? And she's like, yeah, but I'm not her counselor, I'm yours. And so we began to talk and she been, began to ask me about, you know, she, she sensed that, that I had some anger. And I was like, I'm not an angry person. I'm like, I'm like, I'm a happy person. I'm not, I'm not angry. She's like, yeah, I know that's kind of what bothers me. She's like, I want you to tell me about a time in your childhood when you were angry. I was like, oh gosh, which one? Tell me which one you want me to choose. And, and the truth is, is as a child I, or a kid, adolescent, teenager, I mean, you, you pick the, the, the stage. I was a lot. I was a lot to handle. I know that shocks a lot of you. I appreciate that. But, <laughs> but I was a lot. Just ask my mom. I was a, I was a handful. I, had a, I was a middle child. That tells you everything you need to know, right? Like I had an older brother that was perfect. I had a younger sister who was the baby and she was the favorite by far. So perfect, the favorite, me. So I, lots of acting out, getting, you know, looking for attention, you know, knowing I can't live up, knowing I'm not gonna be the favorite, you know. And on top of that, one of my top five gifts, thank you, Marcus Buckingham, is competition. So in the midst of all that, I was a lot to handle, and my, my mom, regularly, I, we would get into these shouting matches and, and, and um, man, I, I owe my mom a lot, but we would get in these challenges, these challenging conversations. Finally, my mom would just send me to my room because she liked, yeah, I was a lot of it. And, and, and for good reason, she'd send me to my room. And some of you have done that and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I would go to my room and, and then I, I just, I didn't know what to do with what was making me upset and making me angry. I remember telling my counselor this and she said, so, so when you go to your room, then what? And I was like, I don't know. She's like, but what would you do? I was like, oh man, I'd throw stuff. I'd be mad. Sometimes I'd cry. Sometimes I'd go to sleep. Depending on the age I was at, because I guess that's to my room a lot, like at a lot of different stages. And she said, well, okay, well then after that, then what? And I was like, I mean, then nothing. And she was like, but when would you come out of your room? Like, I was like, oh, after I was done being mad. And she goes, and then what? I said, stop asking that. Nothing happened after that. It was just, that was it. I go to my room. I stopped being mad. It's over. And I remember her head dropped. And I was like, what is that? And she goes, Here, here's what you were taught. She said, little boys, when they're young, they look to their dad uh, when they're little, to, to their, their dad, if he's in the home, to, to who they should be when they grow up. And little girls, they look to their moms, you know, who's, who they should be when they grow up. But when you get to adolescence, it shifts. In early adolescence and then into your teenage years, you actually look to your opposite sex parent as to how you're to, to relate to the opposite sex in, 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 in life. And she said, one of the lessons you learned is that um, in your anger that you're gonna be lonely. And I was like, really? She's like, I think that's why you have a hard time expressing your disappointment and and." and anger to your wife. It's because you're afraid if you tell her what you really think, if you tell her what's really making you mad, that she'll send you away and that you'll be lonely. And the truth was, is that I began to unpack with her all of these destructive behaviors that I was sabotaging our relationship and I didn't even realize it. Things that I was doing to create, to widen the gap and decrease intimacy in our relationship because of the things I was grabbing back from my past and dragging into the present in our relationship. And, and even worse, that some of these relate, uh, were related to fa false and failed expectations I had in our relationship. And so what that caused is sort of a debt debtor relationship in my relationship with my wife. And there's, as you know this, there's nothing intimacy, intimate about a debt debtor relationship. I mean, you may have a great relationship with your mortgage broker, but you're probably not going out for Valentine's Day with him or her. Like, it's, it's just, you, you pay them what they expect you to pay them, you pay the debt what you owe, and things go well in your relationship. A debt-debtor relationship eliminates the potential for generosity. Don't miss this, this is so important. Your spouse or the person you're dating or the person in your relationship they can either owe you or they can love you, but these two cannot coexist. They can either owe you or they can love you. And if they owe you, you'll never experience love from them. And if you owe somebody in your relationship, you're not free to love them. See, our inclination towards generosity 
to, to protect and to trust and to hope and to, to persevere. Our, our, our ability to move in that direction, it, it, it oftentimes, it rises and falls on our ability to solve this puzzle. See, it's not just about, hey, I'm gonna work hard to protect and to trust and to hope and persevere in the midst of difficult circumstances. It's no, no, I need to think rightly. I need to understand reality about what's actually going on. This is not about catching somebody. This is not about pointing a finger. It's about, I gotta understand, I gotta put the puzzle together of what's really going on. And, and then I can choose to be generous again. I, I can, I'll move towards generosity because my failed expectations and what I saw coupled with who I am what happens is it makes it really difficult to believe the best. So I'm gonna give you a tool. You're gonna laugh at this because it seems kind of silly. Here's how you deal with this. I'm gonna give you, a, this is unbelievably practical. It's one question. When you're in a sit- midst of a difficult situation where you're, you're experiencing some insecurity or, or it's a confusing situation or there's some uncertainty about your future or about what's happening in the relationship or it's difficult, it's really challenging. Here's, here's what you should do. You should go to your significant other, your spouse, and you ask them this one question and say, hey, do you have time for a puzzle? Do you have time for a puzzle? Like, I, 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 here's the thing. I don't know. There, there's two puzzle pieces here. And, and I don't know if it's what I see in this situation or if it's about who I am. And, and I need your help putting together this puzzle to figure out because I'm having a difficult time being generous towards you and our love. And I do, it's created a gap. This, it's created a gap in our relationship. And it's too big for me to cross. And I need your help solving this puzzle. And in fact, you could even start that way. You could say, hey, I was puzzled about something. This sort of puzzled me. And again, I'm not saying it was what you did. And I'm not even saying it was your stuff. It's just, you did this and this is how I took it. And I don't know if it's because of me or, or what, but, but this, is, this created this gap in our relationship. It's something I saw or heard or experienced and it, it's making me feel this way. Pick an adjective. Now, here's one of the things I want you to know is I realized there are 50-piece puzzles and there are 50,000-piece puzzles. In fact, Costco has a 60,000-piece puzzle, if you didn't know that. So there's, there's, there, these puzzles are varying degrees, but it's the same principle. In all of these puzzles, in the most puzzling and difficult circumstances in your relationship, I promise you, these two things are at play. There's what you saw and what you experienced and who you are. It's what happened in the relationship and what you brought into the relationship. And usually this is the root for one or both of you. And, and, and here's the thing. You, some of you are here today and you, you may need help. This sometimes it's, a, it's an easy puzzle. You figure it out on your own. You put it together. Maybe sometimes a few friends, you talk it through. Other times you need to, you need to spend a season focused on this. Sometimes you need to go see a counselor to help you sort this out. And before we get to the end of today, I'm gonna give you some resources. We have so many unbelievable resources here as a church to help you in these circumstances. But this this question, this question right here is about, can you help me? Can we work on this puzzle together? Now, in the most the most fascinating and maybe the most important research that's ever been done on our relationships. There's a guy named uh, John Gottman. He's sort of like the godfather of romantic relationships. And, and the reason he, he's that, and he's not even a, he's not a, a Christian scientist. He's, a, he's a, a psychologist that studied thousands of hours of people who were in crisis in, in marriage relationships. And as he's studying these marriage relationships, he had a team of people that were watching. People gave consent and they watched thousands of hours of therapy And after watching thousands, tens of thousands of hours of therapy, they were able to discover and and, and whittle down to one trait, one difference between couples that in the midst of that therapy made it and couples that didn't. There was only one single difference that was common among every single one of them. And then as a matter of fact, after that, uh, with north of 90% accuracy, they would be able to predict. They were predicting as couples would come in, they would predict whether they would survive or not. You know what the difference was? Is in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of danger and insecurity and uncertainty, the couples that made it were couples that moved toward one another. And here's what they did. They decided they were gonna solve this together that they were gonna see themselves as one. They were gonna see themselves as a team. And that whatever the problem was, is it was almost like they set it across the room and they were like talking to the counselor. It's like, hey, we have this problem over here. 
and we can't solve this puzzle. We can't figure this out. Can you help us solve that? That was the couples that made it. The couples that did not sat in a room and said, hey, this is the problem. We have this problem. And my spouse is on this side of the problem and I'm on this side of the problem. They would articulate the problem. And the problem was that they saw each other through the lens of that challenge, which made the other person the problem. You see, choosing to solve the puzzle together might be the very thing that keeps you together. It's the very thing that allows you to continue to love, to continue to see the other person as worthy of your generous love. Now, when you do this, you can't be passive aggressive. Some of you are gonna go asking about a puzzle with a case built and you're gonna build a case. That's not solving a problem together. That, that takes me back to what Paul said. Remember Paul said, love does not delight in evil. This isn't about pointing a finger. This isn't about finding fault. It's in the midst of danger and confusion and uncertainty and difficulty. What love does is it, it always protects. I'm coming to you with this puzzle because I wanna protect you. I'm coming to you with this puzzle because I, I wanna continue to trust you. There's a gap in, our, in, in my ability to trust. I'm coming to you solve this puzzle because I have greater hopes for us and for our future. And I'm coming to you because I don't wanna quit. I don't wanna give up. I wanna persevere in this relationship and I can't solve this on my own. There's an extraordinary humility and an extraordinary generosity in that. Years ago, there was a couple that are still real active in our church. Uh, some of you may know them, uh, Kurt and Martha Renshaw. And Kurt and Martha uh, came at a season when they were in a really difficult place in their marriage. It was actually when we used to have the environment called Intimate Encounters. We changed the name on it. If you didn't know or hear about that, I told the story the first week, but it, it, we changed the name and we still have uh, these married groups where we walk alongside people in difficult seasons of marriage. And Kurt and Martha joined one of these groups and the truth was, is they were in a season where physically on the outside, everything was going great. Kurt had this amazing business and it was thriving. I mean, it was, it was growing so fast and he was having to spend a lot of time at work, but it was growing unbelievably fast and, and he was very successful. But their marriage was on the rocks. And they came and they signed up and got involved in this intimate encounters group. And in the context of this group, Kurt began to learn all sorts of things about Martha that he didn't know before. And he was very frustrated in their relationship and he didn't know why she was acting in certain ways. And he began to realize like that she had grown up poor and, and she had trust issues. And she was assuming the worst about him that eventually he would leave her and he'd leave her with nothing. And, and so Kurt did something extraordinary. I mean, he, he realized he had his own stuff as well. It was one of the things that was keeping him at work all the time. And so he did something extraordinary. He contacted an attorney and decided to draw up papers. And what he did was he signed the entire business over to Martha. No ownership for him anymore. It was all completely hers. At this point, he's like, if I leave you, I leave you with nothing. Don't miss this. You are worth more to me than this business. You're worth more to me than my success. You're worth more to me than what I'm gonna retire with. You're worth it. And I wanna protect you. And I want you to trust me. So I hope for more in our relationship. And I don't wanna quit. That's what generous love looks like. Don't miss this. This is the gospel again. This is what God did when we were in danger because of our sin. He wanted to protect us, so he sent his son to us. When, when we were confused about the direction we were going in, he, he did something extraordinary so that we would trust him. Because he hoped. He hoped that in the midst of even the uncertainty of faith, that we would move toward him. And Jesus, all the way to the cross, he persevered. Because you were worth it. You were worth it. That's the model of a generous love. I don't know how couples do it apart from a faith relationship with God. But that sort of love, when it penetrates your heart, 
is something that allows you to free to be free to give that to somebody else. You cannot give to someone else what you have not received and possessed for yourself. So may you be filled in your heart with the generous love of God that you could offer it to the people around you and experience the true intimacy that God designed for you to experience in your life. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for these weeks. Thank you for the truth of your scripture that we stand on. That, that It's so funny to me how science and psychology and neuroscience, it's, it's catching up in some ways, but affirms these things that were written long time ago. Your truth that's been around for a long time. I, I pray that we would be people that would trust you. I, I recognize it's really hard. A lot of these things we've talked about in these weeks, they're hard things to follow through on. They're hard things to trust you with, but, but that's the, the essence of what you call us to. It's the essence of what you ask from us. And the promise is, is that if we'll trust you, it will go well for us because you've come that sent your son that we would have life. The enemy has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I just pray your protection over hundreds and thousands of relationships represented in our audience and online today. Pray your protection. I pray that you would intervene, that you would give people a sense. You'd fill them up with your generous love that they would begin and be, feel, be freed to move towards one another with the sort of generous love that you offer each one of us. That's your name we pray, amen. Wow, this series has been fantastic. And I don't know about you, but it's been super impactful. But you know, maybe there's somebody in your life that you need to share it with. You can go to our YouTube page and share the three-part series, Intimate Encounters. And so you know what? You're not gonna miss next Sunday either because we are gonna be celebrating all that God has done through you, through our Be Rich initiative. You've given, you've served, you've loved others so well, and we wanna celebrate it next Sunday. So hope to see you then.